very good evening to you all um, to this last event at the Silk Road Literary Festival. My name is Sam Knights. Uh, I'm a, a, a barrister. I specialise in um, human rights, um, but I'm also director of a literary festival in Devon, in England, and I've been on the board working um, with Sophie Ibbotson and Azam Abidoff and many others um, to get um, this Silk Road Literary Festival off the ground. So it's an absolute pleasure to be here and, and delighted to see the uh, wonderful programme that um, Sophie has put together um, today. We're obviously the last event of the day um, and we're very conscious it's um, 10 o'clock um, in Tashkent where um, Azam is. And so it's yeah lovely to see people joining us. We've got people actually from um, the West Coast, from from Seattle, west coast of the um, United States. We've got people from um, all over Europe and uh, people from London and also people um, in Tashkent and um, elsewhere in Central Asia. So a hugely warm welcome to you all, wherever you're joining from. Um, I'm um, delighted to be here with um, Azam Abidov. Azam, um, many of you will uh, know he's a poet, um, he's a short story writer, He's written um, a number of books of poetry. He's translated um, books um, into the, um, the English language, including tunes um, of Asia, the island of anxiety. He's translated Ghazals and an epic poem by Alicia Navoy and other novels. Um, he was a creating, creative writing fellow at the University of Iowa in the US and a writer in residence um, in Berlin. And um, as well as all of this, he's also been instrumental in creating a literary community um, in Uzbekistan. He's been organising creative writing workshops, um, cultural events and exchanges, um, not just in Uzbekistan, but in other um, languages too. So we're going to talk um, this evening about um, creating literary communities and in one sense about, I suppose, how we came to create um, the um, Silk Road um, Literary Festival. Um, as with all of the events, it's designed to be as interactive as possible. So please do put questions in the question box um, and do feel free to let us know where you're joining from this evening in the comments box. We'll aim to get to as many of your questions as uh, as we can. So we won't, um, we'll go on for about 35 minutes or so and then we'll um, turn to questions. Um, but Azam, I wanted us to sort of start off in a way by contextualizing and going you know, back and looking at um, you know, how Uzbekistan has got to where it is in, in literary terms. I mean, you obviously grew up in the in the um, Soviet period. I mean, how are you taught uh, literature at, at school? You know, how we, uh, what was happening in that in that period when you were growing up in, in Uzbekistan? And were you taught, you know, your the canon of Uzbek literature as well as the canon of Russian um, and Soviet literature? What was what was going on? First of all, I'm so, so delighted to be online with you as part of this festival. And congratulations to Sophie and everybody who put together this great festival, at least online. I'm so happy to be part of it. And thank you so much for talking uh, to me today, tonight, uh, Samantha. Uh, about your question, um, I grew up, uh, yeah, my childhood uh, comes to the Soviet period. Um, only the last year of mine, at school uh, was independence during the independence year 1991 i graduated from the school in 1991 when we we got our independence uh, so but most of the most of the years i i, I studied at, at school uh, basically we studied very general uh, literature uh, at school starting from grade first up to 11th uh, and we started we started uh, from uh, elementary uh, basics of ABC of literature. Uh, we started learning very basic um, knowledge of literature, Uzbek literature. Uh, but when we when we got like uh, grade four or grade five, we started learning something about Soviet literature, and we called it really Soviet literature. 
and 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 then we started learning something about Russian literature, uh, Belarusian, Ukrainian, uh, our neighbors' literature. So uh, about like fifteen countries in the Soviet time we had. So we started learning something very generally about their literature as well. Um, one thing I remember uh, from my school years, we didn't actually uh, have a lot of. Uh, uh, books available in our school library. Most of the books I <clears throat> I could sign up uh, sign out was it uh, was in Russian. We didn't have a lot of books in Uzbek for some reason. Yeah, maybe maybe it is you know only in in our school because it was maybe uh, we we had both Uzbek and Russian classes in my school when I when I studied. Uh, maybe that's why we we did have many many Russian Russian books, not Uzbeks. But still, I could go to a children's library in in, in the central city in Namangan. Uh, I could go there and and check out some some good books in Uzbek as well. But the majority of the books we could uh, read was in Russian. Uh, uh, and I and I, and I went when I um, went to uh, university, 1991. That was the first year of independence. We kind of that the bro uh, the the area of my in interest was already broader. I I <clears throat> I studied actually Uzbek language and literature. My major was uh, uh, in Uzbek language and literature, so I started learning more about uh, uh, not all, all already like ABCs, but already something uh, uh, good, something intense in terms of Uzbek literature, world literature. We could have. Uh, a lot of books from the university library. By then, uh, 1991, uh, we could have something at least in Uzbek translation uh, translated uh, from target language Russian. Actually, target language was all the time Russian to, to read something <clears throat> from world literature. I still remember uh, we, we did have a lot of uh, books in Russian, but we also had some good classical literature translated into Uzbek. Um, I remember we had we had Shakespeare, we had uh, books by um, uh, uh, Byron, or uh, we had books by uh, American writers like Hemingway, Mark Twain's books, especially his um, uh, stories for children. We we kind of used to to to, to read them in in Uzbek. Um, mm -hmm. Most most of the uh, stories or novels we could read from the um, actually manuals or, or textbooks we had at university. But in schools uh, during the Soviet times, we only had like a short biography of a writer or a poet and, uh, and a story uh, or, or a biography and, and, uh, and several poems of, of, a, of a poet from, from different countries. Uh, mm -hmm. But we so, didn't... Sam, if I can just sort of jump jump in there, because I mean, I just wanted to kind of pick up on this, yeah, this theme um, that you mentioned about this sort of by you know these two streams of language. I mean, I lived in Soviet um, Moscow for almost a year in 1990, and I was you know spent I spent some time at MGU there, and of course, you know, my sense was of being in Moscow at that time was an immensely literary cultural sort of environment. There were, you know, Dom Kanigi everywhere. There were, yeah, there were lots of bookshops. There was, you know, a very vibrant Samizdat um, tradition. So people were, you know, they did struggle to get um, some, you know, well, lots of Western books simply, you know, it was a market sort of, you know, reason and a legacy of the Soviet period. So, but there were sort of books being brought in actually by people and then passed around. Um, but of course, you know, I was there, I was in, in, in Moscow and, and I was being sort of introduced to the, you know, the great canon of Russian literature, but I was very unaware at that time of you know, the great canon of Uzbek um, literature. So I did go to Uzbekistan in that period, um, but, you know, I didn't have enough time there to sort of delve in to, you know, the sort of literary circles there. But I, I mean, I'm wondering... Were were writers in the, that period in the nineties, um, were or even you know, in the eighties, were they um, in in Uzbekistan? Were they um, predominantly writing in Russian, or were were they writing both in Uzbek and Russian? And how do you think if the, if they're writing sort of bilingually, how do you think that sort of 
influence the sort of literary environment? Did it enrich it, or, or you know, how, what was what, what was the impact? Or as I know, in the Soviet times, or early um, independence years, um, there were poets and writers who write only in Uzbek. But I also know some of the uh, writers and poets who wrote in both Russian and Uzbek, but I, I remember there are not many. I can tell there are not many. There were not many. There were not many Uzbek writers and poets who wrote in Russian, unless they, are, uh, they belong to uh, Russian diaspora. Um, mm -hmm. For well, I know, I know many, many writers who only wrote in Uzbek in the Soviet times and in the, in the beginning of the independence years. But I remember, for example, uh, Sabit Madaliyev, who wrote in Russian, uh, being an Uzbek national, he wrote in Russian. Uh, or uh, I, I know Hamid Ismailov, you know Hamid Ismailov, he wrote uh, in Uzbek uh, and Russian as well. Uh, there were special, uh, like specialized schools uh, in 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 Tashkent. I remember in Tashkent where uh, there there were uh, special uh, groups uh, where they could uh, gather and discuss something in the literary arena in both Uzbek and in Russian languages, but. Uh, during the Soviet times, where I grew up in Namangan, for example, I did not see any writer or poet in my hometown Namangan, for example, uh, who wrote in Russian. Most of the writers I knew or I, I spoke to were uh, only Uzbek uh, language writers. They they created their work only in Uzbek. Um, however. However, I, I remember that there, there was a great interest in translation of Russian and world literature from their target language, which was Russian, into Uzbek. I still remember every, everybody was interested in translating something. I, I, and I read a lot of works in Uzbek from uh, world classics, but most of the works had been translated into Uzbek from Russian. For example, an American writer or Shakespeare was translated from Russian, not from English. Yeah, I mean, and then that's, I mean, that's interesting as, as well, yeah. because, I mean, for, for English, you know, children growing up, um, they often have to be taught Shakespeare because the language is so alien. But of course, Pasternak's translation into Russian of Shakespeare was translated into a very contemporaneous Russian, which was extremely accessible. And so if, you know, if you had received a translation from Uzbek from the Russian language, then the Shakespeare for, for you know, for the Uzbek population um, may similarly have been very accessible, accessible in a way that it actually wasn't, you know, without really having a teacher to um, take to, to English um, students at all. Um, I, I wanted to um, ask you about the, 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 the sort of, I suppose, the censorship in this period, because you know, people, you know, that I, you know, met and talked to in, you know, in Moscow when I lived there, they, you know, they knew what they could get away with writing about, you know, what they couldn't. And, you know, so people were sort of brought up in this environment, I, I suppose, of sort of understanding, you know, where the boundaries, but of course, by the 90s, things were, you know, things were sort of opening up and, you know, breaking down and the newspapers were emerging that were a bit freer. And, and so, what was going on in, in, in Uzbekistan in, in this period? You know, did, did people stick when they were writing to safe topics that they knew were going to be acceptable? Or did people branch out and, you know, try and push the boundaries of, of literature? So in the late 90s, before the independence, we already were open to discuss something openly we already could write something openly. We already could publish something openly. I still remember I used to read a magazine called Yoshlik uh, or Yosh Kuch, which trans translated uh, youth power or youth. Uh, and they kind of 
could publish many good stuff. They could publish very good articles that can give you new perspective of uh, thinking about everything what is going on in the Soviet times. Uh, however, uh, which is what is interesting, what was interesting for me in the, in the early 90, early uh, independence years, there was a great, a big gap between the literature of other countries and Uzbek literature. Why? Because there was something really like very uh, not smooth uh, movement in the, in the country where everything was like a mess. Uh, and we could not get, for example, books as we received from those 15 countries during the Soviet time, we could at least get some books from many, many countries, at least in Russian or in, in, in Uzbek translation from Russian. But in the period, for example, in my uh, student years, 1991, 1996, I don't remember that we could get something new from Moscow or from Russia or from, from other uh, Soviet countries. You know, there was something not very understanding, not very understandable happening in those years uh, when we got our independence. There was like something happening, something there was like very deep hole between Uzbek literature and world literature. And we only could know something about Uzbek literature only. Uh, there was no exchange, there was something as it uh, became for in the in the I mean common life, so social life, and political life, the countries were not uh, able to do something. They were not. They did not even think what will happen next. Everybody was thinking about what will what will be the next. So everybody was very concerned about their future, including Uzbekistan. So I so in terms of literature, I don't remember that we had those, I can say, good stuff that we could have in the Soviet time during our independence years. You know, so we I didn't remember that we could get something from from other from other republics, uh, and there was like big big gap between Uzbek literature and world literature, and unfortunately. Samantha, I can say the same trend has been uh, very long until up to now. So even now we we kind uh, uh, even in these years of openness for Uzbekistan, for some reason we are not getting enough literature or literary works from other countries. Um, despite uh, we are open, despite we are uh, willing to get something from the world, but literature is still in Uzbekistan some way and not there that I wanted to, I wanted it to be. Actually, we are still uh, very much uh, involved in ourselves, very much engaged with, within ourselves, and we are still not trying to open ourselves to the world. We, in other yeah. times, for example, if you receive something and if you could share something with the world, now we are trying to receive something still from the world, but we are not giving out to the world. That's why people ask me and maybe you a lot of questions why Uzbek poets and writers are not available in English or in German or in other languages, people, it's not like, it's not available Uzbek literature nowadays in, in the other world, you know? So yeah. even well, this open, we should come should not give us great opportunities, you know, for us to open up to the world. Yes. Yeah, oh, well, we should come back to talk about, you know, what's happening right now in, in, in terms of, um, of, of, of literature and in what people are, are writing about but I'm I'm interested in your trajectory because 
um, you know, being a writer, being a poet, being a translator um, are, you know, for you, it, you know, it seemed to follow, you know, naturally from, you know, your degree subject at university. And the reality in, in, you know, in England, for example, is the vast majority of students who study English literature or who study, you know, a foreign language um, and the literature of that language won't go on, of course, to become writers or necessarily work in, in lit literary fields at all. And that's partly an economic situation, you know, to support yourself as a writer in England or as a poet is, you know, extremely difficult. And so lots of people yeah. will do it as a second job. But you, but you, you know, despite, if you like, this sort of environment, which you would say, well, maybe, it, you know, we weren't exposed um, very much or not enough to, um, you know, to external influences. But yet, you know, you have been able to carve out a career you know as a as a writer and as a as a translator but is this something which is you know is are there you know are there a lot of you in other words or are you very very unique would you say I mean is there a a sort of you know circle of people like you know like you who are you know creating poetry and you know and building a career out of you know being a writer in Uzbekistan you mean right now yes yeah okay we you know i'm i'm sorry to say this but we are living in a new uzbekistan where uh, so many uh, opportunities are lost i i can tell this uh, i have been telling this for many many years so we are not using so many opportunities for for creative circles in Uzbekistan, we have um, internet, we have so many resources, especially free resources that we can use, but we are not doing that one. I'm, I'm sorry to say that um, Uzbekistan's literature, culture and art still very much dependent on the government's support um, and of also, uh, uh, it is very uh, uh, much uh, controlled by the government. This field is, uh, if 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 we say if you talk about literature, it is very much controlled. I would say uh, by the government. Of course, government supports literature, of uh, and uh, but it the government also um, restricts freedom of speech, restricts freedom of. Um, of uh, uh, telling yourself, I mean, freedom of uh, expression. Uh, for example, uh, you cannot, you cannot, for example, um, publish critical articles. For example, I cannot, for example, uh, publish my article about Uzbekistan's Writers Union. Um, no one will publish it because because this is the only organization in the country that the government supports and believes that the government believes there is no other other circles in the country except for the writers union that's why they give their name to to you to uh, as, as a silk road to the, to the festival uh, I, i'm i'm kind of very very um depressed about that uh, on the other hand there is a very interesting thing here I would like to explain. So literature, culture, and art supported by the government, but also uh, controlled by the government, which means, supported means uh, literary projects, say, could be uh, supported by the government, but it will be them who will dictate or put uh, everything into your project you will not be able to do something independently. I mean, it's something weird, you know? In my, in my understanding, creative circles should be open, independent, and should be able to tell something freely, not under the support of some government or mayors or governors and do something because of they are supporting that. So, I mean, 
the first thing I would I would like to, if I could, I would change this system in Uzbekistan. I would change the system of supporting literature by the government, like maybe in in UK or in the US, where uh, this field is much more open and not relied on the government support. But of course, government support is welcome all the time, but not what, when they dictate something for you to do something. And um, I'm not very happy about the creative circles in Uzbekistan because most of the poets, most of the poets and writers in the country are just dying to be a member of the writer's union which is for me it is like very ridiculous stuff they want to be a member because the writers union give them free clinics or one week uh, vacation or um, holiday in their uh, doorman residence or they can support you to publish your book that's it. I mean, in exchange of something, you are like losing your freedom, freedom of mm -hmm. writing, you know? Uh, what, what I discovered I, in, in Russia when I, was, um, when, in, in, when I was living there in the Soviet Union, were, you know, there were quite a lot of artists that I knew who were subsidized. And as you, you know, have explained, you know, they were effectively given some kind of salary, guaranteed salary, as long as they, you know, they painted socialist realism and you know produce things that supported the the project but in fact you know when you went back to their homes and you were you know am, amongst their sort of inner circle you know they were icon painters and they were painting what was completely subversive religious art at the time and that's what they were really doing and the stuff that they were selling you know in um Ismailovs, you know Ismailovsky park was simply for tourists and you know public consumption but it wasn't really what they were doing so they were finding a way in fact to create and be creative and of course with fiction and poetry you know one can obviously loosely veil things you know I mean if you're writing a biography of somebody then um, of, a, of a public figure of a you know politician or a former sort of president you know that will be heavily scrutinized you know of course um, but you know if you're writing a, a fairy story on the face of it, you know, but you have a potentially have a, a, a hidden political message, then, you know, then one can sort of, you know, get things out and, you know, the obvious, you know, one obvious example, of course, is, you know, Bulgakov, Master and Margarita. But I'm wondering in, you know, in Uzbekistan, was that, was that happening? And is that happening now as a way of getting around the censorship? You know, are people using poetry and fiction to disguise, um, you know, I know that, you know, get a message. Yeah, I know that a group of good, uh, independent, uh, free writing poets and writers, uh, but uh, they they have uh, at least uh, internet and they have at least their social media uh, where they can write. Um, I didn't see actually someone being um, harassed or detained for their writing nowadays i didn't see that one but your uh, um, story or your novel or your article will not be published in the in the magazine or in a literary newspaper we actually do not have many newspapers and magazines in the country most of them uh, already have very small circulation uh, but uh, we, we still have, I mean, at least another platform where we can, where, where we can discuss something, where we can post something, especially our own work, poems or stories. So it's, it's still there as hopefully uh, uh, it will not be uh, lost, I, I hope. But uh, yeah, this is the case. We can at least, at least express ourselves freely on the internet, not not on the government channels. I un, unfortunately I know some of the some of the uh, writers who are 
national poet, for example, I know a national poet. Actually, this is a title, uh, official title that the government gives you. Uh, that poet uh, cannot be aired or interviewed on a government TV channel or radio, which is very ridiculous, uh, you know. Uh, but his, he, he, his title was given by the government, but still he cannot go on air on the government channels. Some independent channels even could not give, could not, they, they inter independent, uh, an independent channel could interview him, but they could not even air his interview. Can you believe? I mean, there is something happening like uh, very weird stuff uh, in Uzbekistan. But uh, overall, nowadays, it's okay. I mean, you still have, and other channels, like alternative channels, for you to share something with your friends, with the world. No one is uh, doing, saying something, especially government is maybe just observing <laughs> and keeping mum, but saying nothing. But still, you have an alternative way, at least now. Maybe in the Soviet times or when we didn't have internet, you didn't have that kind of an opportunity. But now we... Uh, thank God we have this opportunity to share everything, everything we, we think and we write about with our friends and colleagues throughout the world. Yeah. And, and Azam, you've you know, been instrumental in, um, in doing, creating these writing workshops and bringing people into Uzbekistan and introducing um, people from you know, outside to Uzbek literature through your translations. So... I mean, where where did you where did you, where did that all begin? You know, creating these workshops and what you know what future do you see? Uh, where do you see this going in 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 Uzbekistan? What would you like to to do going forward? Right, I have been dreaming to do something similar to Iowa workshop in in the states or uh, something. I wanted to build a creative um, residency like in Berlin, LCB. Uh, literature colloquy in Berlin. Um, uh, however, I couldn't do that because of many, many reasons. Maybe you also know uh, during the Karimov era, I couldn't, we couldn't do basically anything uh, in terms of um, literary uh, cooperation with other countries. Everybody, if I, if I wanted to bring you, for example, to Uzbekistan, you had to get, get through many, many obstacles to get visa or to do some programming in the country. Sometimes we could have, uh, we could bring a, a writer from America, for example, but we couldn't do any programming with him. We could only bring him and just enjoy, enjoy the country, not, nothing else. I mean, uh, so, but now, now with this opening up, of Uzbekistan to the world, um, we could at least do something. And I believe now we also can do even uh, in the future. Uh, so Uzbekistan uh, made very good thing to open its borders for many, many countries to come to Uzbekistan without a visa. So it became visa-free for many, many countries, in, including British, not Americans, but still many, many countries in, in Europe, uh, in Asia. So people could still come to Uzbekistan. I wanted to use this opportunity because, because I have been uh, dreaming to give or to introduce Uzbek literature to the world for many, many years. But it, it, it was very slow because... Uh, I, I, ha I didn't have a, a big group. We had, I had only very small group who wanted to, to work on this. And we did not uh, get that very much improvement in this. Uh, but well, everybody wanted in Uzbekistan, every writer, every poet, wants his or her work get translated in, in some other languages. For example, they always approach me. Can you translate my, my poems into English? Can you translate my novel or short story into English? I say, yes, but, uh, but it will be better for you to learn some foreign languages and make friends with other uh, foreign writers and poets and make some good cooperation in terms of 
uh, engagement or exchange of good ideas and, and doing translation of at least starting with each other's work. Uh, but they did it, it, it didn't work uh, for some reason. Um, I don't know, maybe <clears throat> it is only in Uzbekistan, but, but I, uh, many poets and writers in Uzbekistan are very, uh, not, very not, are not active in terms of improving their knowledge. They <clears throat> want their work to be translated in other languages, but they don't want to learn some languages on their own. Uh, I myself, for example, uh, organized free English language courses, uh, <clears throat> trying to give them very basic knowledge of English, uh, but only maximum five, six people uh, attended the classes, though it was free. And when I was at the Writers' Union to say, to announce this opportunity, they say, oh, Azam, why, why should we go to your classes? Why not other classes? And I say, because it's free and because it's for you. And they don't understand that one. <laughs> that was very, very uh, interesting. But well, I think that's Zama, if I can jump in there, that I mean that sort of also reminds me of the sort of resistance that we have or the struggle we have actually in England now to you know bringing um foreign languages to the forefront at schools, encouraging you know English school children to to learn foreign languages. You know, the um you know the study of foreign languages at university in in, in the UK is at a sort of all-time low. Um and of course that's to the you know the detriment ultimately of of you know of people here being able to experience uh, foreign literature in its you know in its own terms i wanted to bring a um a, a sort of comment in that um samia samia has commented both in the question box and um in the in the chat box and she she says in the in the question box you know what a, what a pure literary tradition you can sort of taste by getting the translations from the you know from the sort of 1990s struggle and the sort of deep sentiments from writing in Uzbekistan and I think what's so interesting about the sort of receiving um, literature in translation for those who don't know the Uzbek language and I sadly include myself in that is that you know the, the way that the translator translates is is you know they have so you know such a sort of choice about you know about the you know how they present the literature so you know an English person if, you know if you retranslated Pasternak's Shakespeare back into English they would you know they would recognize it of course but they wouldn't necessarily recognize it as Shakespeare and um right. I grew up with the uh, with a sort of very old-fashioned translation of War and Peace um, which had been translated to read rather like a Jane Austen novel. And, you know, it could have, you know, but for the fact that you knew it was written by uh, a Russian um, writer, you know, you, it could have been, frankly, written, you know, in the sort of style of an English sort of country house um, classic. And then War and Peace was, you know, about, I don't know, about 10 years ago, was retranslated by a couple um, and they, you know, Russian, I think an English couple, and they worked on every sentence and they translated it into a, totally different type of English so it was much closer um, in lots lots of respects but I'm wondering you know the way that we receiving translations your translator um, of, of, of Uzbek works I mean how what, what are you trying to do when you're translating what are you trying to expose of the underlying language and idea so uh, I can translate uh, from several languages into Uzbek, but that's not my goal. My main goal is to translate Uzbek literature into English. Uh, I'm not a native speaker. Uh, I didn't uh, grow up in a literary or English language circle, but my still uh, purpose is to give a very small sense of what is Uzbek literature and to let this sense to the world. So that was my, my aim and I started uh, translating um, Uzbek poetry into English. It was maybe 20, 15 years ago at least. Um, but uh, now, when I read my own translations of the past year's 
I always um, make fun of myself, uh, saying how many mistakes I did. However, I was not afraid of doing translation because I wanted English language world to at least read something. You know, that was my basic goal. But now, as time passes, I always think about doing a quality translation. That's why I started working with an editor all the time. If I translate something, uh, my first request or requirement for myself is to get an excellent uh, editor for my translation, I mean, English translation. So at that, um, over the past years, I could get uh, and could work with several very good editors in English who are native English speakers. You know, that, that's why I can, I can tell you, for example, if you read my translation of Erkin Azam, uh, a national writer of Uzbekistan, um, who lives in Tashkent now, I translated at least um, uh, one of his novels and several short stories, and we could publish that in, in London. And Carol Yermakova, who is living in UK now, she became my editor. I'm, I'm just giving an example. And we, together with her, we worked on the book to make it readable for English readers for about three months together over the Skype, on the emails. I mean, we have, we have exchanged so many emails and uh, Zoom calls. I mean, she asked me a lot of questions about every sentence she couldn't understand, you know? That was like, a great collaboration and we could make something good for for english readers and i would suggest mm. that any translator uh even maybe when i translate something into uzbek i always ask a publisher or a magazine editor to just look through the translation and make some editing if if it is if it is possible but yeah. it would be, it would be great all the time to work in couple. Yeah. This is a good moment, Azam, your editor. For, for me to bring in um, a question with, by a fellow um, translator, um, Andrew Stanerland. And um, if any of you didn't um, already get a chance um, to go to his event earlier today on the female I, poets of Fergana, yeah. you'll be able to watch that um, yeah. on. Um, on the YouTube channel. But and yeah. Andrew asks um, this, um, Azam, he says, what's happening about setting up small publishers, print on demand publishing, um, the sort of thing that, that one can do um, th you know, through Amazon? Um, he says, this seems to be what independent literature needs. So what, what's going on um, in, in Uzbekistan in that, in that sphere? In small self publishers, small publishing houses or people self-publishing, um, or you know, using yeah. using mechanisms like um, the Amazon print on demand. Yeah. Uh, to speak the truth, I don't like the idea of publishing uh, of self publishing on Lulu or Amazon um, without without having your book edited by some native speakers. I know several uh, young poets and writers who did that one and they and they say for example in their short bio biography they say um, uh, I was born here and there and my first book was published on Amazon and is being uh, sold uh, several copies already something like that you know I mean I mean that's not true no I, I don't believe any Uzbek contemporary writer or poet could sell something on Amazon or Lulu, self-publishing his or her work, because no one knows them. You should promote yourself first. You should be with your audience first. You should go out, you should go abroad, attend literature festivals. I mean, you should let you know about yourself first before putting your book out there on Amazon, which is no one is no one knows you about you and how, how someone will read 
in, in, in when when on Amazon there are millions and millions of books of famous or, or not famous right and poets. I mean, I basically I don't like this idea for a poet who is young, who is doing something uh, uh, only like in the beginning of his writing career, just publishing his or her work on Amazon and just saying, oh, you see, my book was published in the U.S. And it is being sold everywhere. You can buy. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't don't like this idea. And and you they they announce it. For example, they they uh, have their book or work published in English. Oh, uh, translated in, into English by someone, and they don't work with an editor. And if you see even the the page on the Amazon, there are so many mistakes. Even on the on the on the cover on the cover page. They don't uh, write, they don't edit even their cover page. It is there, but who will be reading this? I mean, it's it's not very good. That's why I wrote a, a bigger article about this, asking for young writers and, and poets in Uzbekistan not doing that. Instead, I gave them another option. Why don't you go abroad? For example, if it is not America or UK, why don't you start with India, where also English speakers? Why don't you learn English to go to India and, and, and at, attend some literature festivals there first, if you cannot go somewhere to Europe or elsewhere? I mean, but they say, so what, oh, you what the, I mean, something what, what like that. What are the barriers, that. though, Azam? I mean, I, un I understand this sort of the, 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 your concern about young writers, you know, self-publishing. And I mean, you know, in a way, it's the same problem, you know, here that, you know, if you're a, you know, well, if you're a well-established writer publishing with a, you know, with a re very recognized, um, you know, brand name publisher, you know, it's the marketing that you get a lot of help with and you'll get, therefore get into bookshops more easily and you'll get reviews more easily and, and that sort of thing. And I, you know, with our, with our festival, we have, um, you know, a, a number of writers who are self-published and, you know, and but the reality is most of the people who come and speak at the festival are published by, um, you know, by by a publisher. But we do have, you know, quite a few people who are published by small publishing houses. So that is something which exists. So why is that not happening, do you think, in Uzbekistan? Because the printing costs, I imagine, are much cheaper. The, the You know, the wage costs are going to be lower. So what's what's going on there? Actually, there is no there is no restriction for you to publish your book for your own uh, funds in Uzbekistan. You can do it in any small town or region. There is no restriction on that. I have never seen that one. Uh, you, if you are a, write, a young writer or a established writer, it doesn't matter. You still can get your published if you can. Uh, get funding for that one and no uh, no publishing house will will uh, publish your book for free um, unless you are very famous but still you will not get any honorarium for your published book you will get maybe several copies of the published book only no honorarium actually uh, but there is no restriction that is it's for sure for you to publish your chapbook or smaller collection of poems or short stories, novel in in a smaller or bigger publishing house if you can get funding, you know? But it's the the matter is that not not many poets and writers can get that one. It's very cheap to publish, to get your pub book published. It's very cheap, for example, I, I, I don't want to say the, the, the amount, but still it's it's really very cheap if you but but the circulation, maximum circulation, maximum copies uh, in Uzbekistan now ten thousand. It is considered very big. So first print will be like if you get like ten thousand, that's a very good circulation for any poet and writer. But people usually publish five hundred copies, sometimes even it is ten uh, even hundred copies. You know, I saw even 100 copies. Publishing house, small publishing house can publish your book, uh, uh, only 100 copies. 500 copies, 1,000 copies uh, has become like uh, normal for, for a poet to publish his or her, her book, you know, even for a writer. But if you have, get, can get like 10,000 copies, then it's you are very lucky. You are considered very lucky. But, but the problem is, 
um, who will buy it? Okay, you can just give 10,000 or like 1,000 copies. You can give it like to your like 100 friends, but it will go to uh, to maybe public libraries. It might go to bookstores, but who will buy it if you so, so are not like famous or something? Yeah. So let me, let me, we've got, we're sort of running out of time and I, um, I've got a, a question from um, Samia that I want to put as well. But I wanted to ask you about um, the sort of bookshop um, scene in, um, in Uzbekistan, because, you know, bookshops here have, you know, independent bookshops, uh, you know, struggle in some ways, but, and they've had to find a route around the Amazon problem. And they have to some extent, and some independent bookshops are thriving, but it is really difficult. So with the shoot festival that I um, direct, we work only with um, an independent bookstore, which is our local bookstore. You know, they, when we do our festival live, you know, we they come and they do a pop up bookstore and that sort of thing. And so I sort of know a little bit about the independent um, bookshop scene. And we have, you know, happily in the area I live in in England, we have, you know, in most of the town surrounding we do have really good small independent bookshops but it isn't it isn't easy but these bookshops are such an incredibly important i would say part of you know the cultural fabric of um of of the towns you know without the without the bookshop without the independent bookshop the town would be a much much you know worse place because they're not just selling books you know they're they're you know organizing literary events speaking you know speaker events um authors will come by and sign copies of books um they have notice boards some of them have cafes you know and people drop in on you know on market day for example in our local town and the bookshop's sort of a, you know opposite the market and it's sort of really buzzing then so in Uzbekistan, is there a, is there a sort of is there a, any kind of market for bookshops? So, you know, do you have bookshops? You know, in the way that you you know one one ha one sees them in in the, in 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 the UK, the US, other you know European countries. I know uh, one thing. Um, most of the biggest or bigger publishing houses in Tashkent have their own uh, bookshops right in the in the publishing house in the so publishing house has their like print shop right in the build in their building the same building they have a, a smaller or a bigger bookshop where people can go and buy the books cheaper than than other other bookshops um yes but sm small publishing houses do not have that one but still in tashkent you um, if you if you just walk on the streets, you will definitely see some bookstores where you can buy um, good books uh, published in Uzbek from various publishing houses. But if you go to the bigger publishing house houses, then you can get their books uh, from their publishing uh, from their bookstores. Um, but um, unfortunately, the uh, uh, culture of promoting uh, books uh, from the publishing houses is not very good in Uzbekistan. I mean, they can just put the books they published on the shelves, but uh, they will not be uh, organizing something like a meeting with a, a newly printed uh, book uh, of a writer, they will not be doing that one. Oftentimes, for some reason, I don't know. I don't know why, but I have been giving this idea many, many times. Why, why, why you are not doing this like small presentation with a maybe famous poet or like young poet? Why don't you there? Like you have, the, they have actually their their um, uh, venue. I mean, they have small uh, uh, hall, for example. Uh, by the publishing house, they can do it. Maybe they can do it even in their in their uh, book bookstore. But uh, you don't see it many uh, often time here in Tashkent. But uh, there is a there is a place called uh, the World of Book, uh, uh, and they they have uh, it's a bigger bookstore in Tashkent, right in the center of Tashkent, uh, and they sometimes do a presentation of a book. But still, it's not like oftentimes they do it. But I really want them to to do it oftentimes. 
to promote their book. Oh, we seem to have lost um, Azam, or at least I have lost Azam. I don't know whether Azam has frozen for everybody else. We are also um, almost at um, the end of our time. Um, Mark Rees um, has got a comment. Um, politics and prose is often ranked in the top 10 most influential institutions in DC. And so that's, um, thank you, Mark, for that comment. We have lost Azam, um, but fortuitously, um, almost yeah, on, on the hour. Um, so we'll draw things to a close. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure being um, here this evening. And thank you all for tuning in. And I hope we can do this again. Thank you, Sophie, for organising um, today's event so brilliantly. And um, I look forward to meeting you all in person um, at some point. So a very good night from uh, the small village of Shoot. Come and visit us sometime. Come to Shoot Festival. Um, if you happen to be um, um, in England in October, you'd be very, very welcome. We'll be um, at Lyme Regis at the Marine Theatre. And um, yes, long live um, the Silk Road Literary Festival and um, we look forward to being back soon. So thank you um, all very much.